I'd like to thank Giovanni and the conference organizers for inviting me to join the conference. Um, I'm joining virtually, though I'd much rather be there in person. And uh, today I've been asked to talk about a topic that I am no expert in, but one that I care about. Um, so um, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, this is the topic for my presentation today. Um, you know, in the course of last year, I have perhaps reflected on this more than I would normally have. And to give you an example, I live in Oregon. And in Oregon, most of the high-tech industry is concentrated along this highway. So we have Intel, HP, and a lot of other industries here. And the rest of Oregon, the main industry in the rest of Oregon is agriculture and livestock raising. And in the years past, when my students said they came from these little towns, I only had a vague notion of where they came from. But last year, when I traveled through Oregon because of the pandemic, there was nowhere else to go. I saw this in a very different perspective, right? So for example, how is a student who lives here where there is very little internet coverage, where there are forest fires at his doorstep or her doorstep, supposed to perform in my class compared to a student who lives here where there are all sorts of facilities? And how can I make this more fair and equitable in my classroom? Um, I don't know if I have all the answers, uh, but what I do know is that as a professor and as a professional in the larger context, being aware of these disparities, I want to be able to make a difference in diversity, equity, and inclusion in our field. Okay. So let me first start with just a brief definition of the three terms. Diversity is the representation of all identities, right? So expertise, gender, race, nationality, age experience, right? It evokes the image of a very well-balanced food plate because that gives us a healthy body. In the same way, a diverse workforce means a healthy organization that can grow and flourish and weather storms and setbacks because of the diversity of opinions and expertise that are the richness of that organization. Okay. Equity is recognizing that individuals have different needs and circumstances. So in my example of that classroom setting, right, and allocating resources so that everyone has a chance to succeed. And for me, this picture here says it all, right? There is a stool of equal height for everybody versus a stool of the right height for different individuals so that they can all participate in the game. And inclusion is all opinions are counted for in the decision making. So this quote here sums it in a nice way that diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to join the dance. And in my mind, diversity, equity, and inclusion all go hand in hand, right? So when we say diversity, for example, it means recruiting people of color, for example. You can recruit people of color, but if there is not a sense of belonging, if there is not a sense of being valued, they are very likely to leave. So the three things, and along with that is that as we look to address diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm going to get to this later, but the data that we have has to be actionable. It has to be presented in a way that we can take actions that directly help us address the challenges that we are seeing in diversity, equity, and inclusion. My screen seems to have stalled. Okay. Are we seeing my screen? Have I lost? We see your screen. Okay. All right. So I will share some statistics and the example that I will take is in of women in academia in the US because that is the environment that I'm most familiar with. So when we look at all disciplines, women earn more degrees in higher education than men. 
right? If you look across the bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhD degrees over several decades, women are earning more degrees, but they are not earning the top salaries or the top positions in their organizations, okay? In the STEM fields, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, women are not earning as many fields as as many degrees as men are, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. But if I get to this slide over here that talks about the pay inequity, right? Despite earning the top degrees in their fields, they are not making it to the top leadership positions. So about 60% of the higher education degrees go to women, but only a quarter percent of the women are the top earners in their fields, right? So this means in academia, positions such as deans, provosts, presidents, and so on. Okay. And this continues not just for women, but for different minority groups. Here it has been sliced and diced, you know, in terms of the demographics that are pertinent to the U.S. So you have the Asian, Black, and the Hispanic. And in each case, women earn less and minorities in ge general earn less. Okay. And so this becomes a lifelong disadvantage where there is a pay gap, there is a power gap, and a wealth gap. The women not being represented at the top levels of leadership means that there is imbalanced decision making and policies, which in turn generates greater inequities, right? So if you go in with a lower salary to start with and your salary raises are a percentage, for the course of your career, you are going to be earning less than your male counterparts. And because the salaries are negotiated based on past salary history, even if you take up a new job, you are not going to be able to bridge that gap ever. So that creates this problem of being always disadvantaged financially and also in terms of power equity in the organizations. Okay. So that was speaking generally, but if I take a closer look at just the STEM fields, okay, here I am showing data for doctoral degrees earned by women by their specific major, right? And you can see that at the very bottom here, here is engineering, computer science, and physics, the three fields that matter significantly to advancing innovations in magnetism. We have only 20% of the degrees going to women. This means that we are not engaging the talent pool that we can be. We are not solving the challenges, the problems with the best teams that we can field. Right. So looking at the statistics, only about a third of the STEM workforce is made up by women. And only about a 30th of the leadership in STEM industry is made up by women. So there is a lack of representation of women across all levels of the organization which perpetuates stereotyping, gender bias, and that comes into play because women then lack a sense of belonging, of being valued, of being recognized. And this comes into play very often when we are looking for women who need to be recognized in our field for their contributions. Okay. And it's not just gloom and doom. I bring out these statistics there has been progress, but there is a long way to go still, right? So if you look at this middle graph, I have data on women faculty in engineering, and it is a comparison of data from 2004 to 2013. So there has been an increase, right? So we have 9% full professors. 9% full professors? Really? That's, we've got a lot more to do, right? At my university, I am the only woman faculty in electrical engineering. If I leave, that percentage drops to zero. Okay. So we've all got a part to play here if we want to you know, contribute to addressing the challenges around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then no matter what role we are, personally or professionally, we can do our part. You know, I have a few suggestions here. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but just a few ways in which we can be engaged, right? We can be advocates or we can assist in making that change, filling out surveys that are sent out by the IEEE for salary data and diversity data. That becomes very helpful because it makes that information public where women can use that information in order to negotiate their salaries where it helps build data that can be actionable so that you can take the right actions, implement the right things 
in order to address the challenges of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I include this small little picture here where you have the food pyramid and the same thing shown as a plate. Now, the one on the right is a much clearer picture, which says that your half your plate should be vegetables and fruits, right? So that is the same data being presented in a way that one can understand what action needs to be taken, as opposed to a vague, good, feel good notion about, yes, we need to do diversity, equity and inclusion. Okay? Transparency is a key for many institutions. They don't have DEI goals or they don't disclose them or they don't volunteer the DEI statistics. And that is important if we are going to acknowledge the problem and if we are going to address it together. And commitment from the institutional leaders, right? So we can recruit people from diverse backgrounds, but if inclusion and equity don't come along, it is not going to fix the problem that we are looking at. Okay. In closing, I want to talk about this in the context of the IEEE Magnetic Society. Okay, so we are an international professional organization and about a third of our membership comes from each of these regions. So we come, a third of the membership comes from the Americas, that's the North and South America, a third from Europe and a third from Asia, though not, you know, in each of these regions, our membership is not homogeneously distributed. Okay, so we are about 2,300 strong in regular members and about 200 students um, in student members. So about 2,500 strong in, is our membership. Okay. And only about 10% of our members are women. Okay. And how are we? I'm sorry, Anna. Okay. Um, I don't think that was a question, but I will assume that I can continue with the presentation. Okay. Um, so, you know, within the IEEE Magnetic Society, we work very hard, very conscientiously to ensure that our committees and our conferences reflect our membership demographics, right? Whether it is in terms of gender, expertise, affiliation, what stage of career they are in. And we are making very conscientious efforts to reach out to regions where we have less representation, for example, Eastern Europe, Latin America. And these are efforts that are ongoing within the society, right? Some of the initiatives that you may be aware of is that we rotate the location of our conferences so that people from different regions can easier attend these conferences, right? We give out childcare and travel uh, grants so that members can attend our conferences easier. Women in magnetism group that we use to advertise positions or awards nominations for and so on. So this is, you know, just some of the examples uh, that we have of existing initiatives within the society. But other initiatives that we have taken in view of the pandemic, you know, what came to light is the fact that we don't have to always meet in person. There are a lot of good things, scientific exchange that can take place virtually. And that gave rise to this concept of organizing a conference, a virtual international conference for students by the students. And that gave an opportunity for the students to lead in the field and participate with low or no registration fees. And we very successfully concluded the second of this conference series just a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Uh, we are funding collaboration between students from different countries so that we bridge this um, working together, this group of people who have to work in a very diverse environment. Okay. One of the things that we are looking at is training a workshop for mid-career women so that they can understand how, what it takes uh, to transition, transition into leadership positions and then also innovations in digital publications um, so that conference video presentations that are accessible to our members who may otherwise not be able to travel. So they have access to the science that is advancing and the information that is coming out of the research we are doing in manner that other people are able to.
Okay, so those are just some examples that we have. I'm always open to ideas. I am the past president, but also still actively engaged in the society. I'm open to suggestions that you have in terms of what we could be doing uh, to make the field a more even field for everybody. And I would like to hear your thoughts on DEI. So that is the end of my talk. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you. And I am open um, you know, for questions or to hear your comments. Thank you.